So welcome to the um, Nuclear Science and Security Consortium's alumni series. So this is a great opportunity. We've had almost a decade now um, serving the community through um, this opportunity to train the next generation of nuclear security experts. And now we actually have several of these that have gone on to positions at the national labs or in other government agencies. And so kicking this off is um, Sarah Laterman. She was a student at UC Berkeley. Prior to that, she was um, at MIT where she did her undergraduate degree and then worked in the Pentagon, came to Berkeley, did um, a double master's in public policy and nuclear engineering. And now she's at the IAEA and she's going to tell you about her NSSC experience and then her current work. Um, and, and Sarah was also a fun member of the Nuclear Policy Working Group as well. So we're really glad to see her again. Um, welcome back, Sarah. Thanks so much. That was such a, that was such a nice intro. I do miss the NPWG so much. It was so much fun. I'm, I see some faces here that were in it. Oh, it's a great time, but I'll get more into that. Um, so I'll just kick off. Um, so yeah, uh, like Bethany said, I'm Sarah Laterman. I'm super excited to talk to everybody today. Um, it's a very interesting feeling being on this side of an NSSC talk. I attended quite a few back in Berkeley, so I'm glad to be here on this side of the Zoom. Um, I don't really have any slides or anything, but I was just going to talk to you guys about both my academic and career path, my current job as an associate safeguards information analyst at the IEA, and why safeguards are important for international security. And then once I wrap up, I would love to answer any questions you guys have for me, whether they're topic specific or career specific, just shoot, just shoot at me. <laughs> So as a disclaimer, before I kick off, anything I say today is my own opinion. It does not reflect the IEA's position on any topic. All views are entirely my own. So with that, I'll dive in. Uh, way back in the day, uh, I started my undergraduate work at MIT, like Bethany said, and I absolutely knew that I wanted to study nuclear science. I always loved physics in high school, and I wanted to be able to apply it to real world problems. At MIT, I quickly discovered an interest in fusion, and I was able to intern at MIT's Tokamak, which was a fantastic experience and allowed me to delve into applied physics. However, I had to satisfy my humanities requirement, so on a whim, I took a science, technology, and society class. I had a really fantastic professor and was instantly fascinated by science policy, so I eventually decided to double major with political science. It was through this program that I found out I could really combine my love of nuclear science and political science by sort of shifting away from fusion research and more into weapons and security research. And just to be clear, while I was there, I was not researching how to design, build, or manufacture weapons, but instead I was able to research the physics of weapons and understand the devastating effects that they could have on the people and environments that they would potentially be used against. So after undergrad, I applied to a lot of jobs as I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do, but I knew that I needed a little bit of a break from academia. So that's when I accepted a position with a defense contractor. And after graduation, I immediately started working uh, in the Pentagon for the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Nuclear Matters. There, I worked on a lot of projects, mostly related to nuclear stockpile management, coordination of modernization programs and nuclear survivability of defense systems. I had some passing familiarity with these topics, but the in-depth political and technical information and not to mention the intensely bureaucratic government system were completely new to me. But having my double major really enabled me to bring a level of social awareness to the scientific communities I worked with and a level of technical cognizance to the decision makers. And I really enjoyed this aspect of this job. Um, but after a few years into the job, I quickly realized that in order to make significant advancements in my career, I would definitely need a graduate degree. So I decided to go back to grad school. And honestly, I was afraid that I would get too entrenched in work and lose the motivation to go back at an older age. So I made this decision a few years ago. And once I made the decision to go back to school, 
I started looking for programs that could allow me to continue my studies on both technical and political aspects of nuclear security. And it was really hard to decide between getting a technical and policy master's. So I ended up coming to Berkeley specifically for the joint MS MPP program and to work with work in the NSSC. And it really allowed me to explore these, these topics of interest at the nexus of both nuclear technology and policy. So once I got to Berkeley, I started my NSSC fellowship and I was immediately thrown into the world of nonproliferation. Uh, the first research project that I was part of was a network analysis based exploration of how trade conflict alliances and nuclear cooperation agreements affect a state's nuclear proliferation motivation. Super fascinating topic, worked with Bethany. It was, it was really interesting. We actually just got a paper published on it. So <laughs> yeah, you finally got that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I then very quickly got involved in the nuclear policy working group, as I mentioned, and I was able to collaborate on a myriad of research topics, the most interesting of which studied how a non-state actor could indigenously manufacture weapons grade nuclear material. So as a group, we researched all the steps of the fuel cycle, including novel nuclear material production methods. And we created a model that assessed each potential pathway against a set of metrics in order to quantitatively analyze the attractiveness of each potential proliferation pathway to a non-state actor. Um, and this was sort of my first, not, well, not my first introduction, but my first in-depth introduction into the nuclear fuel cycle as a whole and which areas are most vulnerable to proliferation activities. So from, this re from these various research projects, I was not able to, I was not, I was not only able to get some publications added to my portfolio, but I was also able to see just how the non-proliferation and safeguards world worked. And this led me to develop yet another network analysis model for my MS thesis that assessed the efficacy of both the NPT and nuclear weapons free zones in discouraging proliferation. I modeled these treaties and individual states as bipartite social networks and then analyzed how their various network measures correlate with measured levels of proliferation at both the state and global level. And this was my introduction into treaty efficacy and really analyzing how the NPT and to some extent how the additional protocol to the NPT uh, work and how they discourage proliferation. So in addition to all of the super fascinating inter and interesting non-proliferation work, I really wanted to add to my national security expertise. So I also took on research in this area. I was, while I was at Berkeley, I was a graduate intern at the Center for Global Security Research at Livermore. And here I got to delve into Chinese military and nuclear strategy, which was outside of my expertise, but it was super fascinating learning um, project that I worked with. Professor Nock, who's also part of the NSSC on that. And once that internship was over, it was time for me to focus on my public policy thesis. And I took part in the development of a research project that is actually still continuing at the NSSC on nuclear weapons technologies, escalation, and strategic gaming. So for my part, I utilize game theory models to investigate whether asymmetric possession of high precision, low yield nuclear weapons lowers the nuclear threshold during a conflict between two large nuclear powers. So with all of these opportunities provided by the NSSC and Berkeley, I was able to leverage my experience research to get my current job at the IEA here in Austria. So now, like I said, I work as an associate safeguards information analyst in the open source section which means that I work to verify that what IEA inspectors are seeing at nuclear facilities around the world and what states are declaring about their nuclear programs align with what I can find in open sources. And before I dive into what exactly that means, I wanted to provide a little bit of background for those that may not be familiar with the structure of the IEA. Uh, the agency is divided into several departments, the largest of which is the safeguards department, which I work for. And the other departments are responsible for developing various nuclear technologies, providing standards and regulations on those technologies, and finally bringing those technologies to the member states. So like I said, I work in the safeguards department. 
which is split into three different types of divisions. There's information management where myself and other analysts work. And then there's the technical and scientific services which develop and implement safeguards technologies. So they have to develop these unique detectors or ways to monitor material, what have you. And then they implement those technologies at facilities. And then finally, there's operations, which covers all the inspectors. So that's where the inspectors work. So in my division of information management, there are four sections. Uh, where I work is the state factor analysis section. So like I said, we analyze open source and actually trade information. Um, and we look at how that correlates with state declarations. And I'll delve into this in just a few minutes, but I just wanna first give you an overview of the other three sections. Um, so the second one is the nuclear fuel cycle analysis. And here they evaluate in-field measurements like environmental sampling to see what particles can be found at facilities, um, on specific machines, in a room. It's super fascinating, but goes way over my head. <laughs> um, and the another section is the declared information analysis, where they work with the state declared information, and they also and they also do transit and transfer mapping of nuclear material, both into, out of, and within the state. And then the fourth section. Uh, deals with uh, state infrastructure analysis, and they analyze geospatial and commercial satellite imagery data, um, which is again super fascinating. Um, but a little bit more into exactly what I do. I can't go into too much detail due to confidentiality, but I'll provide a little bit of an overview. So in general, states have different obligations depending on what their individual agreements with the IEA are. But essentially, most member states have a duty to declare to the agency what types of nuclear facilities they have in their borders, what activities they're undertaking at those facilities, and what research is being done throughout the state into certain areas of the nuclear fuel cycle. So based on this information, IEA inspectors are sent to these facilities to verify the accuracy of the state's declaration. Where my team and I come in, is that we monitor scientific publications, news re reports, multimedia, government sources, and pretty much any other information available to the public that you can think of. And we look to see what nuclear related areas are being researched, um, what dual use items are being manufactured or imported, and what facility changes are being proposed or, or even conducted. We then check this against what the state has declared and talk to the inspectors about any discrepancies we find. And these could be big enough to trigger a letter to the state or additional inspections to clarify any information mismatch. All of this activity gets reflected in a yearly report for each state. And from this, conclusions about the state's nuclear program can be drawn. We can then say that yes, the state's nuclear program is peaceful and there's no undeclared activity or no, there is reason to believe the state is conducting undeclared nuclear activity, which may or may not be peaceful. Now, it is extremely rare that the latter conclusion is drawn, but it has happened in the past. So as I briefly touched upon, there are a lot of different avenues of information that go into analyzing a state's nuclear program. And of course, open source is just one of these, but in my humble opinion, it is vitally important. Uh, without this additional check, inspectors would generally only go to places they are told about, which would not be sufficient to verify the absence of nuclear material or activities in other locations, which is part of our mandate. So, for example, a state may declare that they have a research reactor at University A and that material and that there's some material irradiation research being conducted by University A. Inspectors would, of course, then go to University A and verify that the reactor is operating as declared and they can see that the materials are being irradiated as declared. However, the state could also be sponsoring research at University B, which is clear across the state, and they could be researching nuclear material separation, which they have not declared, but could be used as the basis for developing a spent fuel reprocessing program. Inspectors would have absolutely no reason to suspect University B of conducting this type of research. But one of the ways that the IEA would know about it would be through scientific publication monitoring. And so without my team's work, papers from University B 
might never be found and we might not be able to stop a potential reprocessing program before it begins. So that's where we come in. <laughs> and additionally, we can also see where satellite imagery analysis would come into play in this situation. Uh, we can work together to determine if we see any facility changes that were discussed in open sources are also seen in the satellite imagery of the site. Or we can see if construction or facility operation is occurring that is not declared and not found in open sources. This would again trigger a letter to the state for clarification or an unplanned inspection to verify the facility status. So. As you can see, all of this is critical work that allows the IEA to warn the world about the potential spread of nuclear weapons or sensitive technologies. Without the IEA and international safeguards, it would be much easier for states to turn peaceful nuclear programs into military programs without the international community's awareness. And as this year has been quite out of the ordinary to say the least, I wanted to touch on a little bit how the IEA has adapted to working during a global pandemic. So in March, we all switched to working from home with a few exceptions, uh, primarily inspectors. Inspectors still had to travel. They still had to work around border closures, flight cancellations, and a whole host of other issues. So member states rely on the IEA to continue to do its job despite these challenges and obstacles and the agency had to continue monitoring nuclear programs around the world. And while my team is fortunate that we can work mostly from home, a lot of other analysts that work more regularly with classified or confidential information had to continue going into the office despite the danger, although they were going in at a lower rate. The dedication to the agency's mission during this time from the entire staff was really amazing and it really does go to show just how critical the IEA is to international security. Additionally, I wanted to highlight the non-safeguards aspects of the IEA's mandate, which I'm not directly involved in, but are critically important. Uh, the agency brings nuclear technology to areas of the world that desperately need it, but cannot afford indigenous programs. So through the support of more affluent member states, the IEA can set up cancer treatment centers, food irradiation facilities, livestock research centers, disease prevention facilities, and so much more in underserved communities. Without its complementary safeguards program to ensure states are only using these nuclear materials or technologies for peaceful purposes, it would be a lot harder to garner support for spreading these beneficial nuclear technologies to states that need them. So now um, I want to shift a little bit and talk to you more about, um, my about my application experience, how you guys can apply to work at the IEA, what the agency is looking for, and a little bit about what it's like working in an international organization. So I applied to the IEA, excuse me, I applied to the IEA through the Junior Professional Officer Program. This program is designed for applicants under 32. I believe to be able to enter the agency on anywhere from a one to two to three year contract. And they can really get a feel for how the organization works and what the work is like. Uh, these JPO positions are funded through the member states. So I'm currently a US JPO, which means the US sends the IEA money for my salary and benefits and things like that. Uh, there are a lot of JPO positions throughout the IEA, not just in my section and not just in safeguards. You could work in nuclear science division. Um, and they're not just funded by the US. Other states fund these positions as well. They have uh, positions from France, the UK, Russia, Germany, etc. And I can only speak uh, to the JPO application process, but it was fairly straightforward, but it took a long time. <laughs> So first you have to submit an application to the US support program, which in my case turned out to be at Brookhaven National Lab. Then they narrow down that list to those applicants that meet the minimum requirements and they send the applications to the IEA. The section that you are applying to will call you for an interview. And then from those interviews, they can make their short list of preferred candidates, which go up to upper management for their approval. Then the US support program sends you an offer letter and helps you with the move. So just to give you a little bit of an idea on timeframe, I submitted my application in October, 2017. 
I interviewed in January, then received a call offering me the position in April, but didn't receive the offer letter till May or June. <laughs> then I didn't even start work till September 1st. So I would, anybody who's interested, be patient and apply early. <laughs> Um, in addition to these JPO positions, there are what's called cost-free expert positions. So these are similar to JPOs, except they're more for the mid to late career professionals. Uh, these CFEs are still funded by member states, so the application process is similar. Um, but again, I'm not super familiar with that process. Uh, for regular IEA staff positions, the entire application process is handled by um, so for JPOs and CFEs, once your contract is over, you can seek out regular staff positions if you want to stay at the agency, but you have to compete for that position. So it's a totally new application process. Uh, for the regular staff positions, there is generally a term limit of seven years, after which you must leave the agency for at least a year before you can return. So this is to ensure that nationals from certain states don't dominate the staff makeup and stay for decades. And it's also to attract different viewpoints and technical areas of expertise. A certain percentage of staff members do get long-term contracts, which allow you to stay beyond the seven years, but they're pretty hard to get and they depend on a lot of internal politics. So if you're planning to come to the agency, it's much safer to plan for a short or medium-term stay, but you may be able to stay for your career if you're lucky and if you so desire. Um, now that you've heard a bit about the technical, the technicalities of the application and staffing process, what exactly is IEA looking for from its employees? Well, this question is really big and you'll probably get a lot of different answers when asking around, but from my viewpoint, uh, they want and need people with very strong communication and technical skills. So no matter what position you're looking for, you will be asked technical questions about the nuclear fuel cycle. Even for my team, which is composed of mostly non-technical people, um, I had to describe the nuclear fuel cycle and discuss potential proliferation points within it, which the NSSC and NPWG prepared me perfectly for. Uh, the agency really does want well-rounded individuals who excel not only in their area of expertise, but also know how their speciality fits into nuclear safeguards as a whole as you don't only work with people on your team, you work across the agency continuously. Um, you, I honestly talk more to inspectors than I do to my own teammates. So having this idea about how safeguards works as an entity and not just piecemeal is critical to your work there. It's also important to note that most of what we do is a lot of paperwork and briefings. <laughs> So all of our analyses end up in the yearly reports for each state. So the ability to write clearly and write a lot in a short amount of time is critically important. Everyone at the agency also ends up in many, many meetings and gives briefings several times per year to upper management. So really good public speaking and communication skills are definitely necessities to survive here. And like I said, the Nuclear Policy Working Group, NSSC, and Berkeley in general really did prepare me well in these respects. So I think anybody on this call is well positioned to apply and work for the agency. The aspect of this job that I find the most interesting though is the international workplace environment. Working in the nuclear field in the US at national labs or at the Pentagon in my case was pretty one dimensional for me because if you're working at the Pentagon or something, you have a lot of people come from similar backgrounds and everybody's a US citizen. Uh, but here at the IEA, you get to work with people from literally all over the world. So our agency staff comes from over 100 different countries and navigating that realm at times can be pretty tricky, but it's incredibly rewarding. I've been able to improve my interpersonal skills and cultural awareness immeasurably since arriving here. Not only that, but uh, like I was discussing, chit-chatting at the beginning, Vienna is a fantastic place to live. It's really the center of Europe, which makes travel opportunities very plentiful, at least before COVID and hopefully, <laughs> hopefully soon again. Um, the city itself is very safe, it's clean, it's vibrant. There's no end of things to do. There's always a cultural event. If you're at all interested in theater or opera or classical music, or even if you're not, there's a lot of things to do. 
you really couldn't ask for a better place to work from abroad. So really start brushing up on your German. <laughs> and um, I know this talk was a little shorter, um, but I would love to end it there and open this up to questions and make this a little more interactive to really find out from you guys what you wanna focus the discussion on. Great, thank you, Sarah. This was really great. And it's neat to learn um, about all the things that you've been doing. Um, so I'll kick us off with a question and then um, open the floor to folks. So with regard to um, open source intelligence work that you do, um, how much do you rely on science and technology publications versus other sources like image videos or, or the kind of um, open source intelligence analyses that people do like arms control wonk or things like that? Um, yeah, so for uh, countries like uh, North Korea or Iran, I know satellite imagery, multimedia image is essential. Actually, mostly just for North Korea because I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, we're not allowed to inspect there at the moment. So they rely heavily on satellite imagery, multimedia, um, yeah, open source intelligence analysis. Uh, but for the most part, what we rely on for our day to day would be news reports generally um, and government statements and regulations that are coming out of the state. And then when we want, we do on at least on a yearly basis for some countries on a, on a monthly basis or so, we dive into the scientific publications. Um, and that's actually how we find out about a lot of the research the state's doing. So if they, if a state is signed on to an additional protocol, they have to, uh, they have to declare all their nuclear related research, all their nuclear fuel cycle related research. Uh, apologies. And uh, so we monitor pretty heavily and a lot of times we find universities or facilities where they're conducting research that they haven't declared. So I would say uh, the majority of our information is general open source, but the most critical information is are the scientific publications. And then for states that we can't get to very often, it's the satellite imagery and multimedia. Thanks. Um, so I don't know if you want to raise your hand or if you just want to speak up. Uh, hi, Sarah. It's uh, it's great to see you. Um, I have a quick question regarding open source methods. Um, so there are differing schools of thought in the open source community about the suitability of data. You know, some groups will only access things that are you know truly open to the public. Others are willing to access hacked and leaked data. And then finally, some groups like Bellingcat are willing to actually pay for hacked data, but not solicit it. Where does the IAEA's open source community fall? And wh when was that decision made? Um, I don't know about the decision. I know that the open source uh, section was came about in the mid, mid to late 2000s. Um, it's very much the school of, it has to be open to the public. Um, it, we do not, uh, our section does not touch leaked information, does not touch any information unless it's hit a newspaper or something like that where it is open to the public. We don't go searching for leaked reports. Um, that I know that there are other areas of the agency where um, states will come with intelligence information. And as you have seen in the news, I'm sure. Uh, mm -hmm. But that is analyzed at a much higher pay grade than us. That's really at the, um, at really the deputy director general or the director general level. So we're very much of the school of thought. It has to be super public. Um, I know there was one incident a couple of years ago, somebody knew somebody in a company called them and asked for a report that wasn't out yet. And that was a big no-no. Uh, so you can't even use your personal contacts to access reports. This report was very meaningless. This is not an exciting situation, but we just have these very strict procedures in place about how you can access information. Um, so if it requires um, a login, so, okay, something like NukeNet, which is a um, nuclear news con uh, conglomerator, they report our nuclear news and um, 
they just require a email to sign in to the website to access the articles. It's not for pay or anything. Stuff like that is perfectly acceptable. But anything beyond is a bigger issue that we have to discuss with management. I, I'm curious how far that philosophy goes. So if like Bellingcat publishes an article that says X, but it's based on information that they obtained via methods that IAEA isn't okay with, does that then become fruit of the poison tree? Sorry, this is really technical, but it's 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 really interesting to me. Um, so we will make the um, we'll make the analysis group aware of it. Um, say, okay, this is what is being said, and then we will say we don't we don't know what the confidence level in this is. So it's more reattach a confidence level statement to information like that. I mean, it would be silly to not to pretend you don't know something that's out in the public and something that's published, you know, we follow a lot of very uh, extreme extremist uh, literature, either way, just to know what is being said. Um, but again, we caveat very carefully what we think of that information, what we think of the source and how confident we are in the accuracy. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So um, I have another question. Uh, do you have tools, special tools for searching online for the, uh, the science and technology pubs or, um, for example, do you have um, software tools where you can type in a search term and get back data in multiple formats, text, images, video, or is it more of an ad hoc approach? It's a little bit of both. Um, so we have some in-house developed um, database tools, essentially, that scrape the internet with search strings that we provide. We'll search specific websites um, automatically several times a day, and they get compiled into a database that we can then search. So we don't have to run these search strings on websites. Um, so we can put in I don't know, say Rose Adam, we have Rose Adam's website on there. They have a bunch of published news articles about what they're doing. And you can put this website in there and it will automatically gather all the news articles from that site. So it's really great to have it all in one place and we can search very easily. There are some websites that doesn't uh, work so well with, so we have to uh, manually check those. Uh, for the science publications, we have a whole list of search strings um, that have de been developed both by individual analysts specific to their own country or that they work on, or um, we have some general search strings. So, um, you know, for example, like plutonium plus reprocessing or something, but obviously more in depth and complicated. Uh, we also, the agency also um, subscribes to some other software um, I'm not sure how much I'm allowed to say specifics, so I'll err on the side of not, but we also subscribe to some other software um, that's used in other industries and is used specifically for network analysis or um, things of that nature. And they have publications we can search and connect uh, institutions and research areas. It's, it's all very high tech and fancy, but yeah, it's, it's really, um, it's really an amalgamation of all of these methods to make sure we are gathering it all. Oh, and on your topic about the format, yes, um, our news aggregator will collect things in PDF, text, image, video. We can upload videos to it. It's super helpful. It's, it's whoever developed it was great. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so we have a question from Cole. Okay. Hi, uh, this was, Sarah, this was really a great talk. Um, thank you for the, the extra information about the IA. My question is about uh, your comment that both technical and communication skills are really important and what or what are being looked for for people interested in working at the IAEA. On the technical side, are you referring to um, analytical skills specifically for intelligence analysis or maybe engineering knowledge or background, nuclear science or nuclear data? Um, can you provide a little more information about what specific technical aspects are really in demand or that you think are gonna be more in demand? Yeah, um, so currently it's mostly technical in the nuclear science, nuclear fuel cycle areas. Um, 
And there's so many people that work there that were reactor operators or designed reactors, um, people that worked at reprocessing plants, people that worked in enrichment plants, um, people that, you know, have PhDs in different fuel cycle topical areas. Um, that's a lot of what works there. Um, but we do have some people that are pretty specialized with intelligence. We have somebody who used to work for Interpol for tracking terrorist networks. So um, I actually think that if, if you have interest in being more on the analyst side of things, that will come a lot more into play. I, um, I know that my section is consistently looking for people who have done open source intelligence analysis in the past. Uh, a lot of people, they actually are looking to expand the trade group a little bit more. Um, so if anybody has in interest in uh, tracking or experience tracking procurement networks, um, especially illicit procurement networks, that's always very in demand. And I really do think that those skills will become more in demand as more people acquire those skills in general, because again, these things are kind of new, at least in the non-proliferation world. But for now, I would say, yeah, as long as you have a strong nuclear science background and some interest in policy, and interest in analytics, that's really strong. I really do think that was what made me an attractive candidate to them, was that I have both the uh, analysis side and the nuclear science side of things. Hopefully that answered the question. <laughs> yeah, awesome, thank you. Yeah. Hi, I have two questions. <laughs> Uh, at the beginning of the talk, you mentioned a paper on novel proliferation pathways for non-state actors. What yes. was the name of that paper? Oh, um, I think pretty pretty close to that. Um, I'd have to find it. Uh, or like what journal it was in? Oh, it was in the non-proliferation review um, just about a year or so ago, Bethany, remind me. <laughs> Yeah, I can try to Google it and put it in the chat. Yeah, that would probably be <laughs> helpful. I'm sorry, I don't know the specific name of it, but if you search the non-proliferation review for my name um, and Bethany's name, it'll come up. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. And then, uh, so you, you worked at the, the Pentagon earlier in your career. Uh, I'm guessing you probably had a TS as part of that. Did you find that moving to international work after you know, working in the US classified space ever caused any like difficulties uh, or is the work disconnected enough that it was never really an issue? Um, no, so that's a great question. I did have a TSSCI and um, I was actually still, I had it active even for a little bit while I was at Berkeley, um, but then eventually it gets expensive to maintain. So it was dropped, but um, but it was not an issue at all coming here. They're pretty separate. And as long as you get read out of the program, then um, it's, it's really not an issue for anybody. I know actually plenty of people that work at the IEA that come from weapons programs from other states and are far more into the weapons programs than I was. And they still carry active clearances. It's, it's, it's really not an issue, especially like you said, it's the work is pretty disparate and we're not, as an agency, we are not supposed to check for weaponization. Um, it's not something that is within our mandate, although we look to see if we can see early signs of it, um, but we're not allowed to inspect based on um, potential weaponization. We have to see uh, previous activity and previous steps of the fuel cycle. But of course we have weaponization experts in, in the IEA because it's, it's a useful skill. <laughs> Thank you. And I'll also just mention that this paper that Sarah was talking about, so we posted it there in the chat, and this was done as a part of the nuclear policy working group um, research activities. And so I put a link in the chat as well to the MPWG website. Um, this was something that Sarah led um, 
when she was deputy director of the group, along with James Bevins, who's now a professor at the Air Force Institute of Technology. So it's a really great learning experience. I think we bring in a lot of different speakers, um, but it's also an opportunity to do research um, in a collaborative environment with folks from the social sciences and the technical sciences. Um, so if you're interested, please join us. So uh, Sarah Lofton has a question. Um, hi, yeah, uh, thanks for the talk, Sarah. It was really um, helpful to me uh, as someone kind of interested in working for the IAEA. Um, so I have like a more specific question and like a more, I guess, open-ended question. Okay. Um, so my specific question is, um, I guess I'm wondering how your like political background and your like policy knowledge and your education, like how do you apply uh, that part of your education to uh, the career that you're in right now? Yeah, um, so uh, that's a great question. I, um, it's a little more difficult at the IEA because we're not supposed to be looking for motivation. We have to look for um, actual physical steps that the state is taking, but at the end of the day, we look at motivation too. <laughs> um, so in the back of our mind, we're keeping that there. Um, so really knowing politically why a state would proliferate, um, knowing the political situation of the states you're analyzing, I think is absolutely critical. You know, um, it may, for example, um, countries that have very advanced fuel cycles that could easily reprocess or enrich material um, if you know anything about their political system, you'll know, oh, there's the state would never in a million years gain a nuclear weapon. They just would never do it. An example would be Australia. They've had testing done on their own, in their own borders without their consent. And they would just never in a million years develop a nuclear weapon. But you get politicians all the time that say, well, maybe we should think about it, but they're usually very fringe. Um, so it's helpful when a story like that comes out then you can take it back to the inspector and say, no, 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 please don't freak out about this. I promise you they never will. Um, so having that ability to really think about um, how all these political entities interact is, is important, but it's not, it's not necessary, but it's, it's helpful, I guess I would say. Um, but also coming from the political science background, I did a lot of um, analysis on other people's studies actually. So a lot of the background is looking at a, at a study that uses some complicated, complicated correlation metrics um, and being able to sort of pick it apart and say, okay, this is, this is where the process failed. This is why you're getting these, um, these biases and your results, et cetera, et cetera. Um, just that way of analytically thinking about a process is very helpful because then you can take in all of this information you're given because we got so we get inundated with information there's so much information out there on the internet, of course, and being able to think okay no this is clearly. Um, this is clearly inaccurate, this is accurate but has these bias issues and then being able to synthesize that into a final conclusion, I really think that is where that sort of that political science public policy analysis really comes into play. Awesome, thank you. And I guess my other question is just like a general and open-ended. Um, I was really connecting with what you were saying about doing like physics and poli-sci. My undergrad background is in chemistry and philosophy. So I kind of related right. to that. Yeah. And I was wondering if you just had any like insights or lessons learned from doing kind of both the technical and policy in both your education and career for uh, some time. Yeah, um, the, the pithy answer would be find areas they can overlap so they don't do too much work. <laughs> um, you know, you don't want to overstretch yourself because I completely empathize and understand this just, oh man, this is super interesting over here. And this is super fascinating over here. I want to research that and that and that. These are all amazing topics. But at the end of the day, you only have 24 hours in a day and somewhere you need to sleep. So really find the areas where they can overlap, which is what I did in undergrad. I found that 
okay, nuclear weapons effects is a very overlapping subject because you have the social outcomes, you have the economic outcomes, the political implications, plus the actual physics of what happens. So that I was able to really marry those two things there. The IEA is another perfect place for that because not only, you know, you can be as technical as you want all day long, but at the end of the day, you have to have those quote unquote soft skills to be able to communicate that to people, to be able to put it into clear writing, to be able to make anybody care about what you're talking about. And so I would just say really find, find that intersection, stick with it. Don't stray too far outside because you'll go crazy. Thank you very much. That's super helpful. So building off this question of um, Sarah Lofton, how much of the academic research that we do in terms of like analyzing proliferation likelihood or looking at how you would quantify trade networks based on historical data, how much of that, that do you feel is useful in a practical context? Um, and, and maybe the same question for the policy um, memos or briefs that we write. I mean, do you, do you see the impact of this work? Well, I'll start at the end. The policy briefs and memos, so important. Um, I see people all the time that have no concept of a bottom line up front and just, you know, the directors have very limited time to read your your documents and they will only read the first page. So being able to communicate all the critical information that you need to when you have stacks of technical data or stacks of any data um, is very important. Um, for things like proliferation motivation, I actually find that topic was extremely useful because what I'm doing now is looking at cooperation agreements, trade data, um, and being able to have that knowledge of, okay, well, this is a little bit more important than that. And I should focus my time on really seeing, okay, are they in a conflict with a state that has a nuclear program? You know, being able to direct my focus in that way is really important. And I think that that research specifically helped. Um, a little more generally about the technical research helping, um, you know, taking classes on, um, on spent fuel <laughs> was <laughs> super helpful. Um, I'm not really doing anything specifically with technical implementation of spent fuel, but just having that background knowledge of, okay, this is within the spent fuel. This is how you would have to separate it. This is how you would have to maintain it in a repository for centuries. Um, th these are all super important background information. And you can take, you know, don't just take my spent fuel example. That could be any aspect of the fuel cycle. Um, you know, if your specialty is research reactors and material radiation, that is super important for work that's happening at the IEA anywhere. And specifically for open source, um, anywhere that you have any expertise, it just helps you narrow your focus and know what to hunt for. Um, because you spend a lot of time hunting and you don't want to hunt too wide. You want to hunt very specific and focused. Otherwise, a project that should take you an hour ends up taking 10. Hopefully that answered that question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? <laughs> So maybe in closing, um, I noticed that Austin posted um, some information in the chat about um, an upcoming MPWG event. Austin, do you want to say a few words? Uh, sure, I can give a uh, couple words here. Sarah has already done more uh, endorsements of the NPWG <laughs> than I ever could. So thank you, Sarah. That is uh, great. We are hoping to continue to do uh, great research and uh, kind of expand on policy and technical topics throughout this semester. So we're very excited for that. As I mentioned in the chat, the next event is uh, in two weeks on February 22nd. It's gonna be our keynote speaker event from uh, Mr. Michael Albertson, who's currently serving as the new deputy director of CGSR at Lawrence Livermore. And so we're all very excited for that 
that speaking event. And so if you have any questions or any interest at all in joining NPWG, I posted both a interest form link in the chat, or you can just shoot me an email at uh, austin underscore mullen at berkeley.edu. And I'd be happy to talk about it with you. But thank you again for the stellar endorsement, Sarah. Hey, just to throw another endorsement, it, being a part of the NPWG and directing and being deputy director for the last year that I was at Berkeley was an amazing experience. Um, I got to be exposed to a lot of topics I wouldn't normally just, you know, putting your head down and working on your graduate work. It's really important to come out a little bit, experience a lot of other topics. And I met a lot of people that I wouldn't have met, expanded my network, my professional network and my academic network. And that's, I mean, it's ultimately how I got the, um, the internship at CGSR at Lawrence Livermore. So it's an amazing opportunity. I still get the NPWG emails and I still check out the links and everything, you know, it's, it's super fun. I cannot stress enough how much that really meant to my time at Berkeley. Oh, thanks, Sarah. <laughs> Um, so, and then I just also wanted to mention that, um, and I said this at the beginning, but Sarah's talk is a part of um, a, a whole series. And so we have a number of different former NSSC um, students and fellows coming back um, to talk about their role now as nuclear security experts. And so the next event as a part of this series will be um, on February 23rd. Um, and that's gonna be Dr. Daniel Helfeld talking about computer vision vision and gamma ray imaging. And, and there's a link available in the chat as well. So I just want to thank Sarah for kicking off uh, this series and um, for the really interesting and, and important topic that she covered today. Um, we miss you, Sarah. Um, so it's good to see you again. Um, and thanks, everybody, for joining. And we hope to see you at a future event. Yeah, thank you. I miss you guys too. I'm glad to kick it off. You guys have nobody else to compare it to, so I sound awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. Yeah, thanks everyone and have, well, it's night here, so have a good night. <laughs> thank you very much. Have a good one. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.